Hi, everybody. Can you guys all hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, if you cannot hear me, um, let's see. I think everybody here has. I'm just going to give <clears throat> a few more minutes to uh, get into the workshop and then we'll get started, guys. I was just looking here to see if I recognize any faces. I know a lot of uh, the people attending tonight were old past patients of ours. I don't see any familiar faces or names yet, but I'm sure someone, somebody will pop in here. sitting behind me. There may be some people coming in uh, through the presentation and I will do my best to make it as smooth as far as letting them in so it doesn't take away from our time. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, thanks for joining us guys. I know it's, it's evening. Luckily these workshops are now online. We used to do these in person uh, which worked really well for several years. Um, but obviously due to the pandemic, we had to switch them to uh, virtual uh, workshops, which I think are equally as um, effective in terms of being able to communicate the information. Uh, it's just not as interactive. We used to have patient demonstrations in the clinic. We would treat patients in the clinic when they came in, uh, which tended to be, again, a little bit more interactive. But uh, nevertheless, we, we will be some doing some exercises, some demonstrations of some of the treatments that we do here for people with low back pain and sciatica um, throughout the course of our presentation here tonight. Um, we're also going to be talking about ergonomics and chair setups. I know a lot of people are working from home or spending a lot of time sitting in front of a computer uh, during the pandemic here. So we'll touch on that in terms of how that affects low back pain and how you guys can do some quick and you know pretty pretty easy adjustments to make things a lot better for you as far as you're sitting uh, at home or in your home office, okay? So I'm gonna get started. I'm gonna share my screen or pull up my presentation so that you guys can join me here. Okay, so let me just, one second here. I don't know. Okay, give me one second, guys. All right, guys, bear with me here. I'm just trying to pull up the presentation. All right, here we go. Okay, can everybody see my screen with the workshop uh, presentation? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, great. Uh, so welcome guys. Um, my name is, uh, start with introductions here tonight. My name is Raul Lona. I am one of the physical therapists here at M3 Physical Therapy. And I've been here for quite a while. Um, I received my uh, doctorate in physical therapy from USC in 2001. So I've been doing this now for 20, 21 years. Uh, in 2006, I received my orthopedic clinical specialist, which is a board certification. And I recertified in 2016 and 2019. Uh, I have, got I, I gotta update my slide here. I have 20 plus years uh, treating orthopedic um, uh, patients with orthopedic problems, uh, specifically in the lower back uh, and hip dysfunction. Uh, throughout the years, we've published uh, papers on treatment as well as diagnosis of lower back pain. Our clinic has actually been around for almost four, God, this year is our 40 year anniversary. Uh, we have to have some kind of celebration. Um, we've been around since 1981, going all the way back to the, our years in Beverly Hills. We still have a satellite clinic there for those of you guys who are on the West, uh, actually our satellite clinic is here in West Hills. Our main hub clinic is still in the West side uh, near the Century City area. Uh, but yeah, we go all the way back to 1981 and throughout the years, of course, I don't go back that far, but 
Um, throughout the years, we've treated tens of thousands of patients with lower back pain and done it very effectively. Currently, we have uh, six uh, therapists on staff, three at each location, and four of them are specialized in orthopedic uh, care, and two of them are on their way in terms of receiving their, their orthopedic uh, certification um, for treatment of orthopedic dysfunction. Okay, so that is our clinic and our practice. So let's get into, you know, the nitty gritty here. Let's talk about the sciatic nerve, uh, which is kind of the, the nerve in question here tonight. So the sciatic nerve, it's the largest nerve in your body, and it originates here on the slide from your lower back in the gluteal. Really, it comes from your spine, but you can see it here. It exits out of the gluteal area and travels down the back of your leg. Right before the knee, it splits into two nerves uh, called your peroneal nerve and your and your tibial nerve, and it travels, continues down the leg, and it, it terminates in, the, in some small branches in the foot and toe area. That's why a lot of you who have sciatica can experience pain anywhere in the rear end, in the lower back, maybe on the side of the thigh and knee, commonly in the calf, and then a lot of times people with sciatica can pr present with problems, numbness, tingling, pain, and the side of the foot, just because that's the course of the sciatic nerve as it travels down the leg. So now that we know what the sciatic nerve is, what is sciatica? So sciatica is basically a pinching of that nerve as it travels down the leg. Now it can be pinched in several different sites. It can be pinched in the gluteal area. It can be pinched in the thigh, knee area, or even in the ankle and foot can cause pinching of that nerve. And any of those can produce symptoms, uh, which we'll talk about here in a second. So to visualize that a little bit better, the analogy I like to use with patients to, to describe what sciatica is, it's basically a kink in the hose. So if you guys are out gardening and watering your plants out in your yard, and all of a sudden you hear a gurgling sound in your hose and the water pressure decreases, what's the first thing you think of? It's a kink in the hose, right? Obviously. Um, so the first thing you do is you kind of retrace your steps back and follow the hose and try to find where that kink is. And when you find that kink, you release the kink and soon enough that water pressure will start to flow and that gurgling sound will go away. Well, that's exactly what happens with sciatica. Somewhere along the path of that nerve, there is a kink in the, in the nerve that's gonna produce symptoms or a decrease in flow down uh, on the, the distal end or the, the end where the water comes out. Uh, and in this case, this, the pain may be, again, in the thigh, in the hip, in the gluteal, or sometimes in the foot and ankle area. So our job as physical therapists is to more, more in detail find where that kink is coming from. Okay, so we'll talk about how we do that, uh, but we first want to talk about the causes of lower back pain and sciatica. And we'll talk about three main causes. There is probably 10 that I counted the other day, causes of uh, lower back pain and sciatica. However, for the purposes of our presentation, I'm gonna focus on three of them, which may be common to some of you guys here in our clinic today. Um, give me one second. Uh -oh. Okay. Okay, hang on a second. Can you guys hear me? I must have lost the sound. No, I can hear you. Okay, a lot of you guys are mute. Let's see, you guys are muted, but you guys should be able to hear me. Can you guys hear me okay now? Yeah, you guys give me a thumbs up if you guys can hear me okay. Okay, great. Um, I'm not sure how I lost the sound. I know before we were able to hear each other. So I'm gonna go back to the presentation and um, continue talking. Okay, you guys can still hear me okay? I don't know if it's the transferring to the presentation that's causing the sound issue. 
Okay, so let's continue. So we were talking about um, the causes of lower back pain. I'm sorry that you guys couldn't hear me there for a bit. Basically, I was just talking about what the sciatic nerve is, which a lot of you guys already know. And I was making the analogy that the sciatic sciatica is like the, the nerve uh, being pinched is similar to when a kink, uh, when there's a kink in your hose, when you're gardening your plants or your, your lawn, and there's a gurgling sound and you lose pressure in your hose. Well, what we have to do to reestablish the water pressure and to get rid of that sound is to find where the kink is along the hose, relieve it, and then get the, that nerve or that hose to work properly again. So the, the sciatic nerve obviously being the hose, we as physical therapists want to detail out where that kink is so that we can help relieve your symptoms, okay? So that's kind of where we were, where we were, we left off. And we're gonna to start to talk about the causes of lower back pain and sciatica. And the first one we're gonna talk about is the most common one, which is a disc injury. So the first one is a herniated disc. Some of you guys here you know, may have this condition. This condition is most common in somebody between the ages of 20 and 40. Okay, pain is usually uh, with this condition with bending or sitting for too long. Okay, and it gets relieved with standing or walking. Now what the herniated, what the HNP stands for, which you're gonna see that sometimes abbreviated on an MRI or a diagnosis from a physician is herniated nucleus propulsus. And again, the most common cause of lower back pain that we see in the clinic. Think of the disc uh, like a jelly donut. And that's what actually gets injured is the disc. The, the disc on the outside is kind of like a hard bread, like the donut surface. And on the inside, it's filled with jelly, a jelly fluid. When you injure that disc, which is usually due to bending, lifting, or twisting suddenly, uh, that outer bread area can tear and can get bulged. And that jelly inside gets pushed out to the outside of the bread area. Now this first picture on the left that I'm pointing to here is the disc, the white matter here in between the bones. And when that disc gets pushed out uh, or the disc bulges, the jelly starts to push out to the outer part of the disc and puts pressure on the outer part of the disc. Now these yellow things that are coming out of the openings here are the nerves. And these are the nerves that make up your sciatic nerve that travel down your leg. So if that disc gets damaged or bulged, there's not a lot of, a lot of room before it starts to pinch on that nerve. And that's where the symptoms start to, you know, be, start to be um, manifested down the leg. So that's where the kink is uh, with a herniated disc is right here at that disc as it exits the, as a nerve exits the spine, that nerve is being pinched by that herniated disc. Does that all make sense? So these people, again, between the, the ages of 20 and 40, uh, these guys like to stand and walk to get relief from pain. And after a few minutes of sitting, it's usually gonna hurt if you have a disc injury. Okay. So the treatment for uh, a, her a herniated nuclei, a, her a herniated disc uh, can vary. It depends on how the patient comes into the clinic. If they come in with a lot of pain and a lot of inflammation, our job as physical therapists is to try to calm that, that pain and inflammation down. And we may use modalities, we may use uh, sometimes heat, sometimes ice, uh, sometimes our manual therapy techniques may help to improve the spasm or the pain or sometimes the inflammation. We may also suggest or maybe even call your physician if the pain is severe enough that they give you some non, non steroidal um, anti-inflammatory medication, sometimes a dose pack, which is a more um, a stronger medication that is actually a steroid to help calm the symptoms before we can really do work with you. But if you're not coming in with a lot of pain, we may get into the main uh, part of your treatment, which is usually an exercise-based treatment. Um, before we get into exercises at the evaluation, we may get into educating you in terms of avoiding bending, avoiding twisting, which are a lot of the provocative movements that may cause the, the disc to injure itself in the first place. Okay, we will also tell you to avoid sitting, lifting, any repetitive activities. Cleaning your house tends to be a big one that tends to, to cause 
back pain. Uh, a lot of times on Mondays or Tuesdays when patients come back into the clinic from their weekend, on Friday when they left our clinic, they're feeling pretty good after their treatment. And over the weekend, they decide to clean their house, which obviously involves a lot of bending, twisting, uh, and that tends to be a big aggravator. And on Monday and Tuesday, when they come back to the clinic, you know, there, there's a lot of flare up that we have to deal with as physical therapists. So if you do have a disc injury, avoid cleaning your house if, as much as you can. That's when, when somebody to help you clean the house is, is advisable, okay? Some of the treatments that we also do once we get into the exercise component is uh, developed by a gentleman by the name of Dr. McKenzie. And he developed a, a, an exercise regimen where we're doing a lot of extension, which we'll demonstrate here in a second with our assistant. We're also gonna to try to manage that nerve, uh, that nerve mobility issue that you may have. Remember the nerve is being pinched and there's a kink along it at some point. So we need to get that nerve moving and healed. And we have some exercises that will teach you with that as well. But the most important part of your treatment is going to be the core strengthening that we're going to be doing because that's going to strengthen muscles right that attach right near the disc and going to help stabilize that segment so that that nerve does not continue to get irritated and inflamed okay so i'm going to demonstrate some exercises here with my assistant um, here in a second so i'm going to stop sharing my screen here for a second and we're going to see our table all right, so here is my assistant. So a lot of times, like I said, when when patients come into the clinic, um, they may be in so much pain that there's not a lot of exercise that we can do. A lot of it is gonna be positional in terms of what we're gonna be doing with them to get them in positions where it's gonna take some pressure off of that disc. And with a disc specifically, being on your stomach, again, in an extended position, avoiding flexion is something that we really advise. And many times getting them on on, on their stomach is the biggest goal of the treatment. So what I'm gonna do with Amanda here is build up a bunch of pillows um, underneath her stomach and just get her to, to go on her stomach. Believe it or not, just this position alone, if you're having a flare from a disc injury can produce um, relief of, of a, a really acute or painful disc. Now, sometimes it may take two, I'm gonna have you come up here a little bit, Amanda, so I can put another pillow, or three pillows to get somebody in a position where they can lay on their stomach, okay? And again, this alone may cause a, a relief in the symptoms of a disc. Now, why does this extension tend to work for people with disc injuries? Well, it creates an extension moment, which is a position of straightening in the spine which creates force by gravity pushing down on you this way. And that force can actually, the mechanism push that disc, what we saw in the picture, back into the place where, where it should go and take the pressure off the nerve. Now, there's been several studies that have shown that therapy can actually, and various exercises, if done correctly, if done appropriately, can actually create a healing of that disc uh, that has healed in, in, in follow-up MRIs. So this is sometimes where we start depending on, you know, the presentation of the patient. And as our patient starts to progress, we're gonna start to take away pillows from their treatment until they can lay relatively flat on their stomach with one pillow and hopefully, let's take one more off, no pillows. And at that point, it may be two or three sessions into our treatment. And now, Amanda, what we're gonna do is we're gonna accentuate that extension even further and we're gonna prop yourself up onto your elbows. There we go. Okay, so that's more of a cobra position. And then from there, if some of you guys are familiar with yoga, we're gonna go into an upward facing dog where she actually straightens out her elbows and again, creates more extension on her spine. And again, accentuating that force downward through her spine to again, try to push the contents of that disc back into where it needs to go and ultimately taking the pressure off of that nerve. Now, once her pain is under control, what we usually see is that pain that was once in the leg, it starts to come up. And instead of it being concentrated down here, now maybe concentrated, she's ticklish, I'm sorry, <laughs> in her glute area, and it might be more intense here. Um, and that's called centralization, which is actually a good thing where the pain used to be more down the leg is now more in the glute or lower back 
It may be a little bit more intense here, but that's actually what we want. And that's the way the nerve heals from the distal end or further away from the spine. And it starts to present itself more in closer to the spine or central uh, gluteal area. Okay, and that's how we progress. And we know that that nerve is healing. Once we get that nerve to heal, we start to do more aggressive strengthening. And for Amanda, we're gonna do some planks on her knees. So let's go on your knees into a plank position. This is one of my favorite exercises because it activates many of the exercises in your core, which are muscles that attach directly onto your spine. And we're gonna hold this Amanda for 10 seconds and we progress this all the way up until she can hold it for a minute and a half. And again, everybody starts at different levels. We assess where you are in terms of strength and tolerance, and we start you at that, at that different area. So the evaluation that we do, take a break, Amanda, is very important because not only do we find where that kink is, but we're also able to assess what level are you? Are you somebody that needs the modalities and the hands-on treatment? Or are you somebody that can go right into some strengthening exercise, which again is the most important part of your treatment. And if you are into the exercise component, what level are you? Are you somebody that needs to start on their knees for 10 seconds? Or are you somebody now that Amanda's come in 10 times for her sessions, she's gonna do a plank off of her knees. Okay, so go ahead and come on up and straighten, perfect. Now she's gonna hold here and she's already shaking. So she needs to work on her plank strength a little bit more. Um, but this is a progression that we commonly use in the clinic. And again, with the whole purpose of strengthening, take a break, that's about a minute and a half for her, um, of strength, of improving your strength. And again, the exercise, excuse me, the exercise component of your treatment is actually helping heal the nerve as well as that, that disc. And eventually we'll do st standing exercises, squats, deadlifts, Whatever functional exercise you need to get back to doing, whether it's you're a construction worker and you need to stand all day and do a lot of lifting to maybe you're a person who sits at their desk and we need to work on a lot of sitting strength, we'll get to that toward the latter part of your treatment. So it's very progressive, very staged, but more importantly, very individualized to whatever level uh, you are at or whatever you know symptoms are, are allowing us to treat you for, okay? So that is a, a basic progression for somebody with a disc injury. So thank you, Amanda. I'll bring you back in a few, okay? So let's move on. I'm gonna share my, my screen again. And we're gonna talk now about the second most common cause of, of um, low back pain and sciatica, and that's gonna be, let me get back to that slide. So let me just go back here a little bit. So again, what Amanda was presenting with was a disc herniation here, that red spot here in the, in the picture on the right, pinching on the nerve. And again, those extended positions on her stomach pressures that disc and it helps to, let me get a pointer here. There we go. And it helps to push this part of the disc back into where it needs to go. And again, several studies have shown that appropriate management exercise can allow that heel to disc without needing surgery, without needing any kind of invasive procedures like injections um, that a lot of people get nowadays. So, all right, so let's move on to treatment for, or actually uh, people with a stenosis or arthritis. And you, it may be labeled as DJD, which stands for degenerative joint disease, DDD, which stands for degenerative disc disease, all pretty much in the same family, all pretty much the same thing. So these are people with 50 or more candles on their birthday cakes. So if you have 50 or more candles on your birthday cake, this is, and you have low back pain and sciatica, likely is uh, stenosis may be uh, the biggest cause of it. Uh, these people, the way they present is they present with pain, with standing and walking. These are the people that you're gonna see at Costco or Target that are walking around with a shopping cart or a walker and they're leaning on that shopping cart or walker and in a bent stoop forward position. And the reason they're doing this is because they're trying to create space. What stenosis is on basic terms is a loss of space and height. As we get older, we lose height. Some people lose up to three or four inches where they used to be six foot one as they get into their later years, 70s, 60s, 70s, they're now five foot 10. And that's because they lose height in these discs 
uh, that you see here with where I'm pointing to. So this is a normal looking disc here that I'm pointing to with my laser. This, you can see that that disc is almost pretty much gone and flat. And here you have a situation where it's pretty much bone on bone. And what happens with these people is where here there's normal space for that nerve to live and travel down your leg. Here, that nerve is being smushed because there's no more space here because that disc is essentially gone. Okay, so that's the basic mechanism in terms of why these people have pain. And we just saw a lady here a few minutes ago where she didn't really have pain in her back, but what she did have was she had, her complaint was pain in her calves and cramping and specifically with standing, or does she have it with sitting? Uh, standing. Mostly with standing. So she was a classic presentation of somebody with spinal stenosis where that disc was being pinched, but the symptoms weren't necessarily in the back. They were more in the lower part of the legs. These people are gonna want to sit and bend forward to get relief because that again opens up, opens up space in their spine and takes some of that pressure off the disc, okay? Anybody have questions with that before I move on? Because I know it can get a little confusing with the disc injury. You can just raise your hand or unmute yourself. We good? All right, I'm gonna move on to treatment. Uh, again, the presentation is gonna dictate the treatment. Uh, sometimes, you know, the patient comes in with a lot of inflammation, with a lot of pain. Again, the modalities are gonna be important for us. The modalities that we have in our clinic our laser uh, light therapy, we have electrical stimulation, we have ultrasound, we have traction. We use any of those, a combination of any of those to help people with a lot of acute pain. Uh, manual therapy is a hallmark of what we do in our clinic. Most of our patients get some kind of manual therapy, whether it's light massage, to joint mobilization, to joint manipulation. And again, sometimes if the pain is too severe, then we may call your physician and actually recommend that they give you some uh, anti-inflammatory medication, whether it's Advil, all the way up to, again, a, a steroidal dose pack. The education we provide for these patients are, you know, essentially very basic, decreasing upright activity. If you like to walk, what we're going to tell you is, all right, I don't want you to stop walking, but let's give you an alternative to walking. Let's have you ride a stationary bike every other day instead of walking every day to start to take some of the pressure off uh, off that nerve and, and, and spine when you're in an upright standing position for too long. We'll tell you to spend more time sitting. We'll try to do some strengthening and sitting. Even sideline positioning can be very important. A lot of the patients that come into our clinic um, can't tolerate sitting, can't tolerate standing. So we'll put them on their side and open up their spine to take some pressure off of that nerve and allow that nerve to heal and some of the inflammation to go down. Traction can be useful for these patients. Traction has not been shown to be helpful for people with, um, with, uh, with disc injuries, but it can be helpful for people with uh, stenosis or arthritis. And what traction involves is uh, a machine that pulls on your spine and creates space and stretches and holds you. And we have one of those machines here in our clinic. Again, we'll be doing nerve mobilizations and exercises, which I'm gonna demonstrate here in a second. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that we can see some of the exercises that we're going to be doing here. There's somebody that wants to get admitted. I'm gonna admit them here. Yeah. Cindy, you back with us? Okay, I think you're there. I just let you in. Okay, I can so assistant here again. Cindy, you're with us? Yes. Great. All right, so we're going to have come back in, and Amanda is going to be a patient. Uh, Amanda, how old are you? You have stenosis or arthritis? I am 70 years old. 70 years old, 70 birthday candles. Um, okay, so Amanda has pain with standing and walking, so we're going to start with some basic sitting exercises to, again, try to open up that spine to take some pressure off of the nerve. So a basic exercise that I tell a lot of our patients to do is sometimes sitting at the edge of the bed before they get out of bed, they're really sore in the morning. So we're gonna have uh, Amanda do a flexion exercise where she bends forward all the way down her spine. I'm gonna move the camera here and she's going to hold this position for, start with 10 seconds and then we're gonna move up to sometimes a minute of holding. We just gotta be careful that she does not get dizzy, okay? 
that's a nice, easy way to start some opening stretching exercises for somebody with stenosis. Come back up, Amanda. So we're gonna give her different positions to, to do these exercises now, Amanda, I'm gonna have you on your back. And go ahead and pull first one knee and then both knees toward your chest. Now what this is doing, again, it's creating a stretch in the back of her legs and her gluteals and ultimately in her lower back. Again, opening up that spine, taking that pressure and relieving the kink, here's the kink on that nerve to hopefully reduce the symptoms down the leg. Once this, and then another way to do this and facilitate that I have my ball here, we're gonna do heel slides. So feet on top of the ball, Amanda. And then again, push the ball out away from you, not all the way, good, now pull it back toward you. And again, a nice easy way to again, promote an opening stretching of the spine to again, take pressure off of that nerve. Good. So let's say Amanda starts to get a relief in symptoms. I'm gonna take the ball away from you. And we're gonna to start to, again, what we talked about is some of the most important parts of your treatment is the strengthening, because that's really is what's gonna make a difference in terms of stabilizing your spine. Now, people with arthritis tend to, even though it's a stiffness problem that they're coming in for, a lot of times it's the, it, what we call instability that's causing some of the pain and shearing uh, along their spine. So we really wanna strengthen those core muscles that attach onto those vertebra close to the nerve to prevent that shearing from occurring. And again, minimizing inflammation and taking pressure off the nerve, allowing that nerve to heal. Okay, so uh, what we're gonna do here, Amanda, is we're gonna squeeze your glutes and we're gonna slowly raise your hips up off the table, one vertebra at a time. Again, creating space in her spine and promoting strength of those gluteal and back muscles and also her core and abdominal muscles. And then we're gonna roll back down. Okay, let's do two more, Amanda. When you get to the top, I want you to hold this one for 10 seconds. And then come back down. Raul, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Would yeah. that, um, that stretch also help for like a pulled muscle, a the, muscle strain? The one she's doing right now? Yeah. Uh, I would say it can, but in the latter parts of the healing of the muscle. Early on, you probably want to focus more on stretching the muscle, which were the previous two exercises we demonstrated. This may become late. This, this may help later on. Again, exercise actually helps on the cellular level where it actually starts to get the cells that are damaged uh, in the disc or in the nerve to start to heal. But this one, I may say, you know, in the latter parts of your healing, not right away. Okay, okay. so maybe like 10 to 15 days after the injury? As long as your pain is improving with stretching, okay, with, okay. with the first couple exercises that we may give you. Okay. okay. Yeah, because if you do the strengthening too soon, you may overload the tissue that is trying to heal, and you'll mm -hmm. actually go backwards. That's why, you know, seeing a therapist that's really watching your exercises is really skillful at it, that prescribing exercises is so important. And even going back further is having the right exercises, right? So going through the evaluation, finding where the kink is, finding the tissue that is damaged so that we can give you the appropriate exercise to start to heal that tissue, okay? So okay. the next exercise we're gonna do with Amanda is a marching exercise. This particular exercise uh, targets the transverse abdominis, uh, some of the deep abdominal muscles that again, attach onto the vertebra, onto that arthritic area of your spine. So Amanda, go ahead and raise, march one leg into a 90-90 position. Good, hold, keep the stomach muscles nice and tight here. Don't let the pelvis move as you raise your left leg up. Now hold that one there, perfect. Now bring the right leg down and then the left leg down. Great, left leg comes up this time, or the right, good. Right leg goes down, left leg goes down. Now this one, I want you to bring the left leg up first and then the right leg. Good, now hold it here. Now, Amanda's been doing this for two weeks. We want a progression. It's getting too easy for her. So now Amanda, keeping this tabletop position, go ahead and straighten one leg out without letting your pelvis move. Very good, okay, bring it back. And then the left side and back. Try to bring, on the next one, try to bring it a little lower. Okay, good. Now try to do the left one as, as low as the right. How did that feel in reality? Good. No, I mean, I know that's one that's been bothering you. 
working my back. Okay, do you feel that snapping in your hip? Yeah. Okay, so Amanda is a patient in our clinic and we've been working with her. So this is an exercise that she's had problems with uh, for quite a while. So we're trying to work with her. Uh, and and that, that is the truth. But anyways, I'm just demonstrating a, a type of progression of exercise that we would do in the clinic for somebody with stenosis. Okay. And again, these types of patients, we also progress once they've, they've mastered these exercises, once they, they're starting to feel better, we start to get them up on their feet and in more functional positions, whether it be sitting, whether it be getting down on the ground. A lot of times our patients come in and they tell us, I have pain getting down on the ground, trying to read and play with my grandkids. So we'll get down on the ground and do some exercises on the ground to try to simulate and mimic those positions for them. So again, we work toward function. We just don't give you random exercises and send you home with a, with a list. We, we have you master those exercises and we start to work toward what is meaningful and important for you because ultimately that's what you're coming in to see us for, okay? All right, thank you, Amanda. All right, I'm gonna share my screen again and we're gonna go through this, the third cause of uh, low back pain and sciatica, which is Okay. Give me one second here. Okay. Okay. Here we go. So we're going to go through the last one, which is. Um, people with sciat uh, sacroiliac joint yeah. dysfunction. This is, a, this is one that gets missed often. This is one that we see a lot in our clinic. And it's someone, it's, it's one that people come in for, you know, when they've been to other physical therapy clinics um, and they've not had any relief and it's been missed. So this is a common one that, that we see a lot in the clinic and has been treated at other providers and just doesn't get better until they see us. This particular dysfunction is called sacroiliac joint dysfunction, SIJ. And the age of this one varies. We've seen patients from the age of 13 years old, some young, young, young athletes usually, all the way up until 80 years old. And basically what happens here is, is that there's an obliquity. I'm gonna get my laser pointer again. Obliquity means that there is a rotation at this pelvis or maybe this one that causes one pelvis to move forward and the other one to move back. Now this red area here that I'm pointing to with my laser, that's the sacroiliac joint right there. That's the, the joint between the, the pelvic bones and that sacral bone that eventually leads to your tailbone and your back. And that creates pressure when there's a rotation that is created along that joint, there is pressure along the ligaments and pain. And it, it can cause, because the nerve travels down this area that we saw in our first slide, when that rotation is significant enough, it can create pressure on that nerve and create the sciatic symptoms down the leg. Commonly, these people are going to be um, reporting that their injury started when they fell. Not always, but that's a common thing that we hear in the clinic. Commonly, patients with this problem are going to be females more than males. Reason being is that the female pelvis is a lot more mobile. Uh, for birthing purposes than the male pelvis. Most male pelvises are very stiff and don't move very much. The female pelvis tends to move a lot. So it is prone to this type of injury because again, the pelvis is shifted or rotated out of alignment. People with this type of problem have pain with transitionary movements, getting in and out of bed, getting in and out of the car, twisting and rotational time movements tend to cause pain. And when they come in, a lot of times the hallmark is when they tell me, and I ask them, where is your pain? And they point, I'm gonna see if I can demonstrate this. They point to right here. This is where it hurts. And when they tell me that, I know that a component of their pain is along the sacroiliac joint. Okay, so it's pinpoint pain right along that sacroiliac joint. Treatment for these uh, particular patients. Again, initially these patients are gonna come in and the, even though they they may be acute, they tend to tolerate manual treatment really well. So we may get into manual treatment right away. And the goal of the manual treatment is to align and normalize the alignment of the pelvis. And we have various techniques. I'll demonstrate one of them in the clinic here today with Amanda. 
uh, where we can get that pelvis back into alignment. Sometimes it involves using our hands and just manually moving that pelvis back to where it needs to go. Other times we use exercises with muscle energy techniques. Other times we use manipulation or adjustments to get that pelvis back to where it needs to go. Uh, commonly there's soft tissue injury or tightness that we have to take care of. So we'll do that with our hands as well. And eventually once that pelvis is back into alignment and it's moving well the way it should, again, the important part of the treatment is going to be the strengthening to keep that pelvis from rotating again. And these types of exercises are gonna be very specific to each particular patient, okay? So I'm gonna just demonstrate a quick adjustment that we may do for somebody with a sacroiliac joint problem uh, with Amanda. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we're gonna come back to the treatment table. All right, Amanda, so I'm gonna to try to adjust your pelvis so that we can take the pressure off of those ligaments in the back of um, in your sacral area. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull your pelvis toward me here and I'm gonna slide your feet away from me this way. And again, not everybody gets this type of treatment. This is just a nice one that we like to demonstrate with our workshops because it's quick and it's easy. And I know Amanda and I know that she can tolerate this. In fact, she really likes this one. So Amanda, I'm gonna have you put your hands behind your head. Good, now squeeze your elbows together. And I'm gonna have you help do like a little crunch and then turn to your side. There we go. Okay, good. So then I have her in position. There we go. And I push, I push, I push, and we go here. And it's a quick little burst. And it can be, you know, pretty, pretty quick in terms of, you know, the, the reliefs that they may feel. Again, the purpose of that adjustment is to get that pelvis to situate itself uh, back into where it needs to go. Very effective, very quick. These patients, again, are commonly missed because people think it's got to be the disc, it's got to be the arthritis, but a lot of times it's this particular problem if it's not getting better. And again, the treatment is very simple, very quick, and these patient, patients can actually get better within two or three sessions. The pain goes away and we can start strengthening and within maybe six or seven sessions, they could be done with treatment with us and back to living the life uh, that they wanna live. So we talked about three common causes of sciatica. Each very individualized, each very specific in terms of how we evaluate them and how we treat them. The treatment is dictated, and I'll say this again, by the evaluation. You must be seen by a therapist who is going to evaluate you for your specific needs. And again, identify where the kink is so that we can administer the appropriate treatment. If we just you know, evaluate you, but don't identify the right kink, then our treatment is not gonna be correct and you're not gonna get better. So that treatment, that one-on-one -on -one time that you spend with your therapist and our patients come in and they spend 45 minutes to an hour with each patient or with each therapist, with their therapist every session. And that initial session may be even a little bit longer because we wanna be able to identify where the kink is coming from and you start getting treatment that first day to start you know, getting better and feeling better right off the bat. Okay, so very, very important to get diagnosed and treated, you know, appropriately. Okay, let me just, I'm just frozen here. So let me go back to. Okay, okay so. What, what, I mean, a lot of times, you know, we, we have these, these issues and we, we delay treatment, right? We don't, we don't seek treatment. We hope that it goes away. Most of us want to ignore problems, right? When we have a problem, we, you know, especially if it's involved with pain, it's like, gosh, let me take some Tylenol or some Advil and hope that it goes away and we try to ignore it. It's the worst thing you want to do because if you ignore pain, especially in the lower back with sciatica, it gets worse. And when it gets worse, it's a lot harder to deal with. Several studies have shown that people who get treatment within the first two weeks of the onset of pain can you know, avoid down, down screen or downstream costs and time related to treating back pain. Because if you don't treat it right away, eventually you end up going to your physician, 
you end up going, you know, getting an MRI, an X-ray. You may, you know, be seen by an orthopedic surgeon who eventually says, "Oh, you don't need surgery. You just need to go to physical therapy." If you start with therapy right away, we think that we can help 90, 80 to 90 percent of people without needing to see a physician or getting expensive MRIs or expensive, you know, procedures. Uh, we as physical therapists can see you without a prescription uh, in the state of California. We are a direct access profession. So you can come see us without any kind of prescription. Now, sometimes certain insurance companies will require you to, to have a prescription from a physician, but we can deal with that at, at a later date. But we at, Phys at M3 Physical Therapy are available um, to see patients right away uh, without a prescription, without seeing your physician um, and start helping you and feeling better right away. So it is something that we, that we do for our patients. So don't delay um, and, and come see us if you have back pain and sciatica, because we can you know, help identify and diagnose you, find where that kink is coming from and start helping you feel better you know, pretty quickly within the first session in most cases. Okay. All right, something that we added recently because of the pandemic that we talked about earlier is ergonomics. Now, a lot of you are sitting at home. So this is kind of an extra bit that I've, I've thrown in recently to help patients who are sitting at home and maybe having back pain. And just some simple tweaks to your chair can make a big difference. Okay, when we talk about ergonomics, uh, three things to consider for home office ergonomics. You wanna fit the chair to your body size. Not everybody is the same. You wanna fit the chair to your spinal attributes, which means that your spine can be different whether you're male or female and the requirements can be specific to each. And then the third thing is you always want to have movement, which kind of goes back to that exercise component we talked about. Okay, so you want to, in, 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 when, you, when you start to select a chair, and I'm not going to talk specifically about certain chairs, I'm going to talk more about the principles of what you want to look for in a chair and why it helps. And you, you want to make sure you, you, it supports your posture. So this is a, an ideal a, a posture for a, a particular person sitting in a chair. Notice there's 90 degrees at a lot of the joints in the hip, in the elbow, in the knees, 90 degrees. Armrests are really, really important, which we'll talk about in a second. So making sure that you have an armrest to support your forearms and then having a nice long trunk here with the screen at about um, maybe the top of the screen at about the, about the height of your forehead. Okay, no, no higher or lower than that. Otherwise it's not a good alignment for your eyes. So that's basically what you wanna look for in terms of the setup of what you should look like ideally with, with, um, with a chair setup. Again, we talked about fitting your chair to your size. Not everybody's the same size. We have smaller people, we have bigger people. So your chair should accommodate for that. Uh, the best thing I tell people to do is when you buy a chair, if you can avoid buying it online, please avoid buying it online. Go into the store, go into the office, Home Depot, whatever is open right now and try it on. It's just like, you know, you wanna test drive it a little bit, make sure that it fits you appropriately. What you wanna look for is a seat pan depth and size. Basically the seat pan should come out with the seat pan is what you sit on, what your fanny is on, should come out just short of your knees, okay? It should be, it should not be hitting the back of your knee or your calf. It should be about two finger breaths short of your knee. Again, you wanna look for a chair with armrests and you wanna look for a chair with, with a back height that's appropriate. You want it to come up to about your upper back area. And the more adjustments, the better. If you can have adjustments in your lower back, in the C-pan angle, the tilt, the depth of it, all, and the height, obviously, very, very important. Obviously, the, the adjustments on the armrests are really, really important so that you can adjust the armrest to fit the desk that you're going to be sitting in. Because if the armrests don't adjust, they may not work with the desk that you're trying to, to, to sit in and, and do your work. If you're a male versus a female, very important. Males tend to, again, have a very stiff pelvis. So they don't want to be in an extended arch position. They're gonna want a chair that's more recline and allow them to go into this flex posture or this tilted posture of their pelvis. Females on the other hand, tend to wanna to sit at the edge of the chair. So they, they're gonna need, a, if they're gonna sit at the edge of the chair or more toward the edge of the chair, they're gonna need something that supports their lower back because you don't want the space to be created on the right side here. So the left side is the male pelvis 
and the right side is a female pelvis. You want to make sure that if you're a female, you have something that really adjusts and supports your lower back because you need that pelvic support in your lower back because of the position of your pelvis. Males, you want the, the backrest to tilt a little bit to accommodate for the position of, of a flex pelvis. So chairs should not only support your spine, they should also allow for movement, okay? Because movement is gonna be so important. You want it to tilt, recline, uh, spin if, if you can, because you want to, the chair, you, you don't wanna be in a, in a sustained position for too long. Now, why is that? When you're in a sustained position for too long, uh, which is what people who sit at a desk and have a desk job do, it creates what we call anoxia, an anoxic event in the muscles of your, of your spine, of your neck, which basically means there's a lack of blood flow. If muscles are in a, in a position where they're working to hold up your posture, but there's not a lot of movement and you're sitting in front of the screen and typing the whole day, six, eight hours, you start to lose blood flow to those muscles. And that creates a lot of damage and pain that can be very painful and hard to treat if it's sustained and not treated. Um, so you want the chair to be able to move and allow you to move and still be able to, to do your work. Now, this is pretty extreme in terms of the amount of movement that this guy has, but it's an example of a chair that tilts and it's got many adjustments so that you can move throughout your day. The best way, I mean, you're, you're, you want your chair to be accommodating to allow for movement, but the best way to, to avoid a lot of these injuries that can pain that can, that can be caused by over sitting is to, uh, is to get up and get out of your chair. We recommend every five minutes, every 40 minutes, at least to take a five minute break. Even if it's just to go get the cup, you know, water uh, to maybe do a few stretches, which I'll demonstrate here in a second. The best way to avoid pain when you're sitting is to allow for movement breaks. Okay, and that's really, really important. Again, you're avoiding that, that lack of blood flow and lack of oxygen to those muscles and again, preventing pain. And these are some common exercises that we may prescribe to you if you're somebody who sits a lot and is having issues with pain in the postural muscles in the back or maybe even in the neck. Okay, so next stretch is here. This guy here is twisting. This particular guy sitting, stretching his lower back, and this woman here is stretching her chest. All really important muscles that tend to get very tight with uh, sustained uh, postures or sitting for too long. And the last thing to consider for us is consider a, a desk that allows for standing and sitting. Okay, there's a lot of them out in the market now. I just bought some for my kids um, when I set up their, their, uh, their uh, desk setups at home once they're home for school. And they really like it because they're in school for sometimes six to eight hours and having a desk that allows them to stand and sit. This one in particular, actually, this woman is actually cycling as she's doing her work on a computer screen, which again is allowing for that movement that is so important when you're in a sitting position. And again, going from a sitting to a standing position throughout your day, really, really important. This is just a short video that I'm going to show that's going to show how to adjust your chair once you once you do get a, um, uh, a, a Hi, I'm Iris Sokol. Give me one second, let me go back there. So she's gonna give you a few pointers on how to adjust your chair. Hi, I'm Iris Sokol, ergonomic consultant for All Seating, and I'm here to show you the inertia chair. The inertia is a very simple chair that offers a lot of great features and great support. So let me show you how to make the adjustments on this chair. We're gonna begin with the seat height. To adjust the seat height, you wanna raise this middle lever and bring the seat height so that your feet are flat on the floor and your knees are in line with your hips. The next adjustment in the back is the back angle. To change the angle of the back, lift the paddle up while putting your weight on the back of the chair until you get the desired angle and then release the paddle to lock into place. There's a tension control on this back angle. Underneath the front of your chair is a knob and by turning that knob will adjust how much tension the back angle has on the chair. The next adjustment is the infinite tilt lock and that's the paddle, paddle all the way up on the front. To adjust the recline angle, you want to pull the paddle up to unlock, 
recline to the desired position, and then push the paddle down to lock it into place. You also have a forward seat angle adjustment on this chair. You wanna unlock your infinite tilt lock and then turn this knob to adjust your seat angle and then lock your infinite tilt lock back into place. This gives you a slight forward tilt position, which can help eliminate pressure on the knees and the legs, offers better circulation to your lower extremities. We'll go to the other side and you have a paddle here that allows you to adjust the depth of your seat. To adjust the depth of your seat, you wanna pull the seat out far enough so you have about a fist distance between the back of your knee and the edge of the chair. And this gives you the best support for your leg. So having a seat pan that allows you to make an adjustment is a great feature on a chair. The other adjustment on this chair are the armrests. They go up and down and you wanna have your armrests low enough so that if you're using them, your shoulders stay totally relaxed. The last adjustment on the chair is the height of your back. You adjust that by raising it all the way up, dropping it all the way back down, and then it will click into place. And you wanna put it in the spot that the curve in this back matches the curve in your lower back, which really gives you great support. Okay, so obviously not every chair is going to be the same. This is just some pointers and some ideas of what a chair can do. Uh, to me, the more adjustments, the better. Uh, you don't need to spend hundreds of dollars. Uh, the adjustments, the more adjustments you have, the, the chair tends to be more expensive. But again, you want to try that chair out. You want to make sure that it fits you. It fits the curves in your spine. It is most importantly fits you. So it's not too big or too small. Um, but again, chair can make a big difference for you, those of you who are sitting at home and, and have back pain and sciatica, okay? So just a couple takeaways from tonight. Um, you want to make sure that if you have low back pain and sciatica, that you get treatment right away. Don't delay. Again, we talked about delaying can cause problems down the road that don't are unnecessary. You don't have to have uh, the problems that that it, that can come that that can come about when you delay treatment get treatment right away you can see a physical therapist without a prescription uh, make sure if you do come to a clinic whether it's our clinic or somebody else that that therapist diagnoses you specifically to whatever movement impairment that you may have really make sure that they identify where the kink is and gives you the appropriate exercises uh, so that you can start feeling better right away okay and making sure that you don't always have to have manual treatment, but I think manual treatment is a really important part of treatment. Um, and I think it's something that is a hallmark of our clinic. In fact, one of the M's of, of M3 is manual therapy. So that's something that we really emphasize and, and hold you know, uh, important in our clinic. Okay, I'm gonna open it up for questions here in a second. If you, my contact information is here. If you guys have any questions, if you guys wanna, you guys are shy and you wanna email me, I always check my email. If you guys wanna visit our website, our website is there. And if you guys wanna give us a call, you guys can call us at any of the two numbers. You can call directly today for an evaluation, or if you're not ready to do an evaluation, you can do a, a screen. A screen is somewhere where we, uh, basically it's a mini evaluation where we look at your spine, spend about a half hour with you, talk to you specifically about your, your problem and let you know if this is something we can help you with and how we can help you. During a screen, we do not treat you. So that's the one downfall is that you don't get treatment. If you're ready for a full evaluation, the evaluations are again with one of our physical therapists. We have six of them in our, in our staff, three at each clinic, and they can start making you feel better right away, identifying the kink and get you, you know, back to living pain free. So wherever you are in that continuum, whether you would like a free screen for your low back pain and sciatic issue to, to let us, you know, to find out if this is something we can help you with, or if you feel like this is something you can definitely help me with, then give us a call and you can schedule an evaluation. And we are taking appointments currently right now. If you're a little leery because of the pandemic, uh, we are also seeing patients virtually uh, along a, a platform such as this, and we're able to provide evaluative skill uh, uh, services as well as treatment online. A lot of the treatment is exercise based, but again, a lot of times people are at that stage where they're able and, and ready to do exercise and don't need a lot of the manual treatment. So wherever you are, you know, in terms of that, that continuum for back pain, treatment and sciatica, get treatment. Uh, we're here to help. And uh, yeah, 
if you guys have any questions, I'll, I'll take those right now. Nope, thank you. It was nice. It was very informative. No, thank you, Layla. Thanks for joining us. Uh, again, if you guys don't have any questions, you guys can always feel free to email me. If, if something comes up later on and you forgot to ask something, uh, feel free to email me at the email there. Thank you very much. It was very helpful. Okay, Mitchie. Cindy, did oh, you have how late are you guys open? Uh, depends on the clinic. Which clinic are you near, Cindy? The West LA or West Hills? Uh, West LA. West LA. Our last appointment is at 6.30. And are you open Saturdays? We're not right now, no. Uh, well, Monday okay. through Friday. Okay. We um, also have uh, morning appointments as early as 7. Oh, really? Okay. And you guys take all insurances? We do take all insurances. We are at a network with a couple of them. We'd have to do an insurance verification and let you know how that goes. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, I'm, I might just get an appointment to come and see one of the therapists. It's actually not for me. It's for my boyfriend. Uh -huh. uh, he injured himself about eight days ago, and the pain doesn't want to go away. I think he has a muscle strain. So. Yeah. Yeah, like we talked uh, about, the sooner the better, right? Because then it can we can start making him feel better right away if we if we get you know get him in and we can figure out what's going on. Yeah, well, I'm a PPA, so I've been doing like stuff that that I learned that I know how to do, mm -hmm. but the pain is just not getting any better. Yeah, bring him on in. We can we can take care. I of will. Him. I'll email you or I'll call and make an appointment. Yep, give us a call. Great. Thank you, Raul. Absolutely. Thanks for coming, Cindy. Do you handle workman's comp? We do actually, Paula. We do. Uh, we would uh, do a verification to make sure that we have a contract with them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we would let you know before your first appointment. OK. Thank you. Absolutely. OK, if there is no other questions, I'm going to sign off. Uh, I think it's just a little after 6.30, not too bad for me. I tend to ramble on. Um, and uh, I hope to get to look, I look forward to seeing some of you in the clinic. Um, and I hope you guys uh, deal with your low back pain and sciatica soon, okay? Okay, thank you. Okay, guys, you guys take care. Be well and stay safe. <laughs>